That's what I thought you said. Latitude within God's will. So uh, now I will retrace. I've, I've been thinking and thinking, trying to figure out how you got me to talk about that in the 12 by 12 class. And uh, so just to take you back to that night. Now, do you understand latitude within God's will? In other words, everything is not set. Everything is not determined ahead of time, and it just is going to happen no matter what. Kind of like uh, auto run, you know, automator stuff. You know, you push this and it's going to happen. I think some believers think that. In fact, it's tragic that they actually believers think that God's will means that it's all going to happen and I'm just going to watch it, and I guess whatever happens is what he wanted to happen for me. So how we got there, Dale, uh, I think I must have been in, in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 11. So let's, let's go there first. But it's a much larger um, issue than just this. Um, to tell you the truth, that I uh, didn't even start thinking about this till one of my read-throughs the Bible and basically, the way I study the Bible is I read through the Bible. I just, um, in fact, I am a, um, I had trouble at my ordination in 1984, I think it was, or 83, I don't, 84, uh, because I was ordained by the uh, Conservative Baptist Association of Michigan, and the president was there. That's always a dangerous thing. They have the president there of the association. And the first question was, he said, would you name the Baptist distinctives? <laughs> and I, I mean, I just was tongue-tied. I said, Baptist distinctives. I remember in school, B means believers, something, and A is autonomy, and P is priesthood. Uh, I forget them, but, but I said, and this is usefulness. I said, I would love to. Are they in the Bible? Oh, <laughs> that's to the ordination board. And so I have to say that, uh, that I'm not a good Baptist. Neither. I mean, if you, and I, I sh I'm not even going to say that one. I won't. I'm going to not say that one because someone would do it. Um, but let me just, Matthew 11, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> Um, and verse 20. Then he began to rebuke. This is Jesus. This is, this is, you know, in his ministry as he's facing, slugging, the uphill climb, the constant. It wasn't just the pestering demons we looked at this morning. It's the pestering religious leaders. And then the, just the basic hard-heartedness of people. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Now, just, just for a second. Now, remember, I just came from a Holy Land meeting, so I have to say this. There's a sacred triangle of cities, and the sacred triangle, they're on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, Chorazim, Bethsaida. And between those three cities, this is the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, modern-day Tiberias, the pigs, swine dive, Kersey. See, it's hard not to do all that. But there's Bethsaida. That's where Peter and Andrew were from. There's Chorazim, Capernaum, Christ's hometown. In the triangle, this is called in synoptic studies, the Golden Triangle. In the area surrounding this triangle, 60% of all Christ's miracles. 60%. Jerusalem's down there. 60% in this triangle. If you, if you read the Gospels and chart where things happen. Now look at verse 20. Does that mean something to you? He began to rebuke the cities in which most, if anybody has 60% of your money, they've got most of it, where most 
of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Now here's latitude, Mr. Kaiser. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if, isn't that interesting? Now, there are a lot of other words. There's, there's, uh, theologically, there's a lot of words for this, and I'm not espousing and certainly, certainly in no way believe the whole fracas going through the Baptist General Conference that God doesn't know the future. Omniscience means he knows the future, but it means even more than that. And here it comes. This is fascinating. Woe to you, Chorazim, the one up on the bluff made of black basalt right there. Uh, Woe to you, Bethsaida, the one right near the, the northernmost shore of the Sea of Galilee, where Peter and Andrew were from, washing their nets, and Jesus bumped into him as he was walking around the sea. And it says, For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, if those miracles had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago you know, because Tyre and Sidon has a long history. They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, now that could be the contemporary Tyre and Sidon, or it could have been the past Tyre and Sidon. But Jesus goes on, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable in Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Well, there's a whole concept of verse 21 that we're going to come back to. There's another one here. There are degrees of punishment in hell. Dante did not invent the levels of hell. God did. Now he gets to the third city, verse 23, Capernaum, right over there, Christ's hometown, his adopted hometown. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. If the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, if, catch this, if, what the Lord is saying is, that he knows something very interesting. The Lord knows the events in his omniscience that are going to happen. He knows the events he's determined. He knows the events he's foreseen. He's known the events he's decreed. Just put all of your overlays of theology on that. He knows that. You know what else he knows? It's like playing chess with a computer. God knows the, the outcome of every potential choice that individuals could make. Now, if, if I had enough time and did this for a long time, and you didn't know that this was God's will, right here, what I could do is say, out of this fabric, if Sodom, if Tyre, if, you know, Gomorrah had done this, if Abraham had, if Moses had, you know, not been murdering and had shared the gospel with, uh, and if Paul had gotten saved earlier. Um, now watch. Here is God's absolute will of decree. But it's wrapped in this incredible latitude that he allowed all these things to happen and he didn't allow or cause other things to happen. So that's where I got off with the class and, uh, and said, oh, nice. It's going to be a short night. Does anybody know where one of those erasers are? Because I can't talk without writing. In fact, um, thanks, honey. There's one right behind my chair in my office. Whoever gets it first. Cliff's going, he's running. Okay. <laughs> so, let, let me show you. Now, let, let's just take our Bibles. Turn with me 
to Leviticus 26. First, we're going to talk about the Old Testament. Then we'll talk about the New Testament. I want to talk to you about latitude. And I want to talk to you not about thinking and processing. Yeah, see if he finds one, honey. And if he doesn't, you can run and get it. I want you, I want you to be cautious about being on the wrong side of, uh, say, in computer programming. Most of us are interface users. Not, oh, thank you. You are a blessing. Thank you, St. Clifford. Um, most of us in computing are, are uh, not programmer types. Uh, most of us do not understand. In fact, I was at a meeting last week where someone talked about VDI, and it's not venereal disease. It's a <laughs> virtual, digital, I don't know, interface or something. And they talked about PBXs and everything, and at the end of the meeting, they left. And everybody in the room, after they left, said, how much of that did you understand? And we all decided very little. There, there, is two, there are two realms. And I'll, this is the big one, but I'm going to call it God's realm. And this is where God's sovereignty, his decrees, his immutable counsels, his will... Uh, his, uh, you know, bulamai um, will, however you spell bulamai, you know, his will of decree and determination, and his uh, thaleo will, um, all this is over here. And you can put the five points of Calvinist, so Calvinism over here, and you can put all of that stuff over here. And this is what I call the back office. This is this is like the programming language. Have you ever seen programming language? It doesn't make any sense. Just a lot of numbers and characters and stuff. But certain numbers and characters makes a red background and a black font letter. And it determines the size and everything. But it's behind the scenes. Another thing that operates behind the scenes that you do understand are the laws of the universe. Like the laws of thermodynamics, like the laws of gravity. Those operate um, inflexibly, um, and, and well, I mean, when everything changes after Revelation 21, we don't know what all is going to be. But right now, we are governed by these laws, both of thermodynamics and of gravity and of, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and everything else. We discover them. They're there already. We discover them. A lot of electronic work is understanding these laws, uh, comprehending these laws. They operate behind the scene. Now, honestly, if I took this marker and threw it, you know, if I could recognize someone in the back row, I already know from these laws that even though I'm trying to throw this marker there, it isn't heavy enough. And these laws click in, and they're going to make that thing drop faster than, than the, the trajectory I sent it on, and this will not make it. But I want it to make it, and I would try to make it, and I would believe that I was going to make it if I threw it towards someone at the back. But operating behind the scenes are laws that will not allow this marker to make it to the back. Well, you say, come on, we're talking about the Bible. Okay. There are laws here that he has established. The infant, the one we talked about on the throne. We don't even know all these. We know all these that we're supposed to know because they're in here. Now the problem, a few of these in this box aren't in here. They've been deduced by theologians, but they're not in the Bible. They're just logical. But no matter what you want to say, just like the laws of the physical universe, the laws of the spiritual universe are there and established. We cannot change them. Uh, we cannot fully understand these. We certainly, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things are, they, God has revealed what he wants, but even Peter said he couldn't understand Paul's teaching on a lot of stuff. Peter, the apostle, said Paul writes many things that are very hard to understand. And Paul said, don't take what I've written and wrestle over it and contend over it like a lot of what goes on 
in the church today in Christendom. So this is operating behind the scenes. I believe most of this stuff uh, here and, you know, trust all those. That is not what the Bible, the code, the Bible, this is the back, this is the programming language. It shows up here and there. And I could list off to you all the reams of Calvinistic literature that comes from a very few verses. But let's talk about the interface. Let's talk about what you read. The Bible was written not for scholars in Leiden or Leipzig or in uh, wherever you want to talk about. It was written for common people. The majority of the people in the church were slaves. And the rest were agricultural, hardworking people. They read it and believed what it said. They didn't say, well, that can't mean that because, because of the fourth decree of something that is uh, infra-lapsarianistically influenced programming language. And we all, you know what, everybody just goes, oh, wow, this is, oh, boy. Because knowledge makes people, they're just beyond us. Did you know everything that's important to know about the Bible, a child can understand Jesus said, except you become as a what? You will not what? See, it is so simple. So let's start in Leviticus 26. And I want to show you the, uh, the, the interface, the front, you know, the screen of the Bible, the part that, that we read. And, and just real quickly, um, if you read the Bible, if you read the Bible for what it says, then you believe that Everyone, everyone has personal, free, volitional choices. I can throw my marker at anybody. But this box says it's not going to make it beyond a certain few feet here. No matter how hard I throw it, it won't. Because my throwing ability and its weight and gravity and everything else. It, this, but I can want to throw it. I can hold it and throw it. I can decide to throw it. I can throw it in any direction I want. But the back office limits what I can do. Not even, I, I don't even know. But it still limits it. So does this. So does theology, the, the, the doctrines of God, the doctrines of grace, the doctrines of salvation. They're just like the laws of gravity, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, whatever you want to say. But the front office, looking at the screen, the Bible repeatedly, let me just show you, Leviticus 26. Now this is Old Testament, this is the Jews. You have to be very careful about not trying to apply verses to the Jews to us. We're not Jews. Now, there might be a few here of God's chosen people of promise because, uh, you know, there's a percentage of all humans that are Jewish by descent. This was written to ethnic national Israel, not to the church, not to us, to them. And, uh, you know, it's good stuff, verses 1 and 2, but look at verse 3. Oh, somebody will say you intentionally missed verse 2. You shall keep my Sabbaths. The Sabbath was a sign to Israel. But I'm not going to cover that tonight. Uh, no one asked me about that tonight. Verse 3, if you walk in my statutes, now what, with all of your Bible knowledge, what does that sound like? If you, Jews, if you walk in my statutes, if you keep my commandments, they could never keep the commandments. They are bound. Their will is bound. They are dead. There is no... Yes, that's all true. How is it presented? Don't destroy your reading of the Bible by... Have you ever had a conversation with someone that keeps getting interrupted? You know, you say something, they interrupt you. They say, you interrupt, you interrupt. That's what happens when people spend too much time on this site. They can't read the Bible. They say, oh, it couldn't mean that. Oh, it must mean something else. I'm going to have to go see what, you know, Murray says about that. Or Beaky or Sproul, because it couldn't mean 
what it says. And they interrupt the conversation God wants to have. Now, doctrine is vital. And I spent most of my life, why do you think I have thousands of books? And, and I was in school continuously from 1962 to 1999 for 37 years. Within every calendar year, I was enrolled in a school somewhere. This is very important. It should not interrupt the reading of the word. So, let's just, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then, verse 4, I will give you rain in its season, and the land shall yield its produce, and the trees its field. And you can read all the way down to verse 13, and it's just beautiful set of promises. Now look at verse 14. But if you do not obey me, what do you think that means? Oh, they couldn't obey him. I mean, I've read tons of commentaries on this. Let me ask you, the primary, the first canon, if you want to talk about theology, the first canon, canons are established, the first canon of textual interpretation is that the the meaning of Scripture is what it meant when God gave it to the first recipients, because all of this came as letters to somebody. And you're happening to be reading right now a letter to the Jewish nation. That's why we have to be careful. This isn't to us, and this isn't to America. And if we do this, it'll rain, and we won't have droughts in Texas. We have to be very careful about trying to overlay promises to Israel to America. It's like we think we're the second Israel or something. There's enough confusion as it is. But this is very clearly a group of people that were camped just refugees just leaving on a camping trip out of Egypt, living in, in the desert. And the Lord says, if you walk, verse 3, of my statutes and keep my commandments, and I will give you rain and your produce and your fields will read and your threshing, blah, 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 verse 14, but if you don't obey me and do not observe and despise my statutes, if your soul, and it starts talking about their internal motivation and everything else, which... We believe all this. We know that, that he was talking primarily to unbelievers. We know from the book of Hebrews, you don't even need to get into the theology books. You can just read the Bible. The book of Hebrews says that, that a mixed multitude came out of Egypt and that with most of them the Lord was displeased because there was no desire for him in their hearts. You don't even have to get into all that stuff, the theology books. You can just stay with the Bible. But if a child read this, a child would say, it looks like the Lord is giving them about 10 verses of, and by the way, in the Old Testament, God just, just offers, um, in the choice thing, blessings if you obey, curses if you don't. That's the Old Testament. And it's just, we could just go through uh, Tons of passages like this, but I don't want to bore you. Now, there are verses in the Bible, though, in the Old Testament that weren't written primarily to the Jewish nation in a covenant way. And we love those. Like, do you all know this one? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what? Lean not on your own understanding. Was that written primarily to the Jews? No. In fact, that book I'm quoting from is the book of what? Yeah. Proverbs is filled. So, so Leviticus 26 has some immutable truths about God, but it's not for us. It was a covenant relationship that is still going on. Still going on. It's amazing. And God isn't through with them. But Leviticus 26 isn't for us, but Proverbs is. Now, Proverbs was originally written from a father, Solomon, to his son, Rehoboam. But remember, more is caught than taught. And Solomon didn't live most of what he wrote in Proverbs, and so Rehoboam shipwrecked with his life. But Proverbs is filled. In fact, turn with me to Proverbs. Here's a beautiful one in the next chapter, chapter 4. I want to show you a choice that you can make. So go to the mill, you know, Psalms, and the next book is Proverbs. Proverbs, and, and you can read the Bible like this. Don't be afraid of the Old Testament. Just be discerning. Make sure you're not in all the rules. Did you know uh, one of the first questions? You know what the first question I was asked when I got to Calvary Bible Church was? I was a brand new pastor here wearing my Sunday suit, and I was cutting across the lobby, and a person I'd never met before said to me, 
You don't go to restaurants on Sunday, do you? <laughs> I thought, hmm, I wonder what that means, you know? Um, and I said, why? You know, you don't answer until you ask what they're asking. And they said, you don't buy gas on Sunday, do you? I'd just come from Starbucks, and I wondered if coffee counted, you know? <laughs> but it was in my office. And immediately I realized that there were a whole group of people that, that had taken all of the intricate 613 rules that were written to the children of Israel, and they were trying to apply them to Kalamazoo. And they would never drive their car further than a tank. They would drive their car. They weren't good Jews. They went further than a Sabbath day's journey. But they wouldn't buy gas. And I'm not making fun. I'm not. It would be wrong to make fun. I was just, I mean, I wasn't sure how to answer that. And all of a sudden I realized that, that we do need to learn the difference between what was written to the, the ethnic chosen people of promise and what was produced through them for everybody. So that's, a, no one asked me that question. Dale, we're, you're going to have to tell me to come back, you know. But Proverbs, look at chapter 4. Here's an example of this bless, curse kind of thing that is the way God operates in the Old Testament. And look at verse 18. And this is just as good as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. This is Proverbs 4, 18 and 19. But it's the way that God postures the whole Bible. And you're going to see this is in the New Testament too. And just as much as we have people that won't buy gas on Sunday, God bless them. They're focusing on the Lord. Oh, that all of us would slow down our lives and not try and cram in every soccer game and every other sports activity and fit the Lord in. Both we need to guard. Over activity and thinking we're more spiritual because we keep more rules. So there's both ends. But no one asks about that. So let's talk about this, Proverbs. Look at the blessing and cursing. But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Now that would make a good plaque on the wall. That is beautiful. That's a screensaver. That is a good one. That says there's two roads of life. There's the path of the just. It doesn't mean perfect. It means the path of those who are justified by faith, those who respond to God. It's whatever. It's the, the Noah was a, a just man in his generation. It doesn't mean he was perfect. I mean, he had a vineyard and drank and got intoxicated and undressed and everything else. But he was just. He, he had a trajectory in the right direction. He was trusting in the Lord and seeking the Lord and believing in the Lord. Here's the other half. So, so right here, bright path, blessings, Wow. Look at verse 19. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They don't know what makes them stumble. They're just, just jagging along through life and bumping into everything. They're like a blind person going through a corn maze, and they never know where they are, and they're falling over. You know, what, you know what this says? The whole book of Proverbs, the entire book of Proverbs, says if, did you know you can teach Proverbs to unsaved people? It will help them. They won't go to heaven. To have a better life, better quality of life. Oh, they can't understand. No, the spiritual man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They think, they think that it's, it's just good principles, and it is. The book of Proverbs basically tells you how to have a life that, that is very good or how to have a messy life. Uh, this side, your, your weeds are overgrown and your rock walls are falling down, your house is leaking and your kids hate you and your wife hates you and you hate your job. And this side, it's an ever brighter shining pathway. It's personal choices. Uh, Bill Gothard used to go to India and teach principles to unsaved people and it, it helped their lives. That's how the Old Testament is. You do this, you're blessed. And you know what? People could do that. Did you know people can do good things? Oh, they can. Come on. How many of you know unsaved people that are nicer than a lot of Christians you know? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> they are honest. You can depend on them. They are generous. 
How on earth could they be like that? Because what this says is, not all of us are as bad as we should or could be from the fall. And, and yes, there is no salvific, there's a good word, there is no ability we have from our works to save us, to be acceptable, to have an atoning, propitiating sacrifice. But unsaved people can be wonderful, honest, loving, sacrificial. Do you think every person that died in 911 rescuing people in the tower was a Christian? No. People died for other people that both went to hell. We have to be careful we don't stop reading because this is in the background. Let this always be in the background. And by the way, the Lord will never let us get too far off from it. Just like you walk off the cliff, you will fall. You go in the wrong direction, you will find out from, from the heavy-duty theology. The Bible is written, every bit of it. I mean, I could take you, I could do this all night. Look at Daniel. Don't look at Daniel. But do you know what, what God told Nebuchadnezzar? If you will change your ways, I won't do this to you. He wouldn't change his ways. Boom, he got boanthropy. Do you know what boanthropy was? He thought he was a cow. He ate grass. He slept outdoors and got wet. His, his fingernails, you know, there's all kinds of rare conditions. There's avisanthropy and boanthropy and all kinds of things where humans think they're birds and others think they're cows and animals and everything else. God presented to Nebuchadnezzar, just like all the way through, Isaiah is filled with this. Isaiah is filled. You know what Isaiah says? Oh, that you would hearken to me, then your peace would be like a river. You have a personal, free, volitional choice to hearken to God. Isaiah 48, 18. Isaiah 32, 17. Those two verses are powerful. God says, if you will hearken to me, if, if, you, if you will choose what I bless and, and shy away from what I curse, you will have the most wonderful life. Now we know that, that God energizes us, gives us a new heart, a new spirit, but this works for unsaved people, these principles, because God gives us personal choices. Now, it doesn't help them get to heaven. They don't know the Lord personally. They don't even understand why it works. But there are laws, just like gravity, quantum, and everything else, that God says, even if for the wrong reasons you do this, even if, for, even if you don't eat out on Sunday because you're keeping your grandmother's rule, you'll have a quieter life than the people that do so much, they don't enjoy any of it. You see, this operates with or without um, fully being implemented by the Spirit. Okay, let's get to the New Testament because some of you are always a little scared, too much Old Testament. So let's go to uh, Matthew. Okay, Matthew. Starting with the Sermon on the Mount. Did you know we were reading that this morning? Did you know what it says in there? Um, it's the same, it's structured, postured, uh, whatever you want to call it, written, the user interface in Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, and 7, basically says, take no thought for tomorrow, what you shall eat, and what you shall wear, your father already knows what you need before we covered that this morning. You know what that says? Now in the New Testament, remember in the Old Testament, it was bless, curse. And God was pretty serious about the curse part. And look at the Jewish history. They got cursed. In the New Testament, it's different. It's if you obey, then you please me, and you get a reward to throw at my feet because you love me. So you get this love gift to give back to Christ. So that's the positive side. This is all the way through the New Testament. If we could have a service like Paul till midnight, till people started falling out the windows, I would never be able to exhaust. If you will read the Bible as a child, with childlike just it's, it means what it says. The Lord says, 
If you love me, you'll obey me. If you do what I ask you to do, you're well-pleasing in my sight. Now, wait a minute. We know something over here, uh, as I said this morning. The instant we call in the name of the Lord, the, the work of the atonement is done, and all of our sins, past, present, and future, all of them are gone, and we are already seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Every born-again Christian is already that way here. How many of you act like that? I don't. Do you? Do you act like you're seated in heaven around the throne? Want to, wish we could. Real life is, this is our position. This is, this is everyday life. Do you know what the other side is? The other side is neglect, and you face what God calls the consequence engine. Um, there are consequences for neglecting or disobeying what God says. Um, the scriptures say that we're supposed to be filled with Galatians 5. I mean, let's just, let's just start there because you need to be somewhere. Look at Galatians 5, what it says. Again, think about the latitude God has given us. Galatians 5 tells us God's optimal settings. The, the way that God would like us to operate. Now, what, what the Bible never says, no matter what is in this block, is the Bible never says that God forces, makes, I'm talking about against our will. God does not force or make or cause to happen, no matter what, this side. He doesn't. God never make Galatians 5. Here's what God wants. Verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So we have a choice to yield to the Holy Spirit. Or we don't think about it. We're watching YouTube clips of movie trailers. And we don't have time to even figure out what that means, so we neglect that. We're not, say, we're not cursing God and saying, I don't care about you. We don't even know that that's in there. We neglect it. Okay, look what happens. If, if you are taught, by the way, the, the Great Commission says that the goal is not just to lead everybody to the Lord. The whole focus of the Great Commission is teaching them to observe what God wants. Why? Because God's not going to force us to obey and please Him and get reward and have love gifts. He's going to allow us. It's written like He completely allows us to choose. Now, it would be interesting to have us raise hands. How many of us, knowing the strength of our flesh and our human willfulness and pride, how many of us absolutely humbled ourselves in God's sight and said, I, with all my heart today, this is the greatest day of the week, it's the first day of the week, it's your day, it's the day that I get to come before your presence, I get together as my part that I am of your body, O Christ, and I want, as I walk in that building, I want to fulfill your purpose. I want you to, by your spirit, to, and through your grace, to energize me, to, to talk to everybody you want me to talk to, to share scriptures with everybody you want. I'm already way past so many of us. For many of the younger, it was more what they were going to wear and what others were going to think about what they wore and, and whether or not they have a new gizmo that they can show off or whether or not they can talk about something that's happened in their week that will impress. And with the older, it's just refined forms of that. But look what the Lord says. If you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against them. I'm in verse 17 of Galatians 5. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not the things that you wish. But if you're led by the Spirit, see, if you don't think about it, then the flesh 
kicks in. And we all still have it. All of us. It's like gravity, thermodynamics, and quantum mechanics. God has put into the fabric of the spiritual universe that if we don't consciously choose to obey, seeking what the Lord wants us to do, default setting. Right there it is. Have you ever seen the flesh? The flesh gets irritated, impatient. The flesh gets hurt. The flesh won't speak to certain people. The flesh gets even. The flesh one-ups. I mean, the flesh makes rash words. Remember Saul? Very fleshly. Saul in the Old Testament. He said, if anybody eats before sundown, I'm killing him. And his own son. That's a rash statement. His own son, Jonathan. More noble than Saul ever could have been. Eight. And Saul had to eat his rash words. The whole nation rose up and said, you flesh. Well, they didn't, but that's what they were saying. Okay. Neglect or disobey, you face consequences. What happens when the flesh kicks in? We're moody. We feel distant from God. We feel useless. We feel aimless. We feel kind of like we want to go to the mall or something. We just want to watch television. We just don't want, we waste time. And worse stuff. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh. When, when the flesh gets more and more control of us are evident, which are adultery. If we don't have any freedom of choice, God willed, God, God decreed that the pastor of the church that I grew up in ran off with my next door neighbor. She had six kids, he had six kids. You would have thought they had enough going on in their lives. And they left their 12 kids behind and went to Florida together, hitchhiking. What is that? That is neglect. Not choosing. Did God decree that? Would a child think God decreed that? That had childlike faith? No. Did God allow that? Mm -hmm. Why? Because it Part of his plan is this consequence thing. God says, you want that? You can have that. that I will show myself that, that I keep the, I have these inviolable rules, immutable, and the works of the flesh are evident, adultery and fornication. I mean, God says, don't be deceived. You sow it, you'll reap it. You dress like a harlot. The boy will think you're a harlot. Sooner or later, you'll commit fornication together. You know, it's just the way it is, and Christians do it. Why? Because they neglect. They neglect. Uh, here, let's leave that passage. Let's go to Titus 2. Have you ever heard of Titus 2? <laughs> Look at how Titus 2 is written. Titus 2 is written in, in verses 1 through 10. This is what God wants. He doesn't force it. Have any of you had God punching you and saying, you've got to do this, you've got to be a, a child lover and a husband lover, and you've got men, you've got to stop wasting your time, you've got to start filling your three trillion video clips that God gave you capacity for in your mind with stuff that, that will drive you away from God, that will feed your flesh. Does God do that? No. There are consequences, and he chastens us and, and, and you know, keeps putting roadblocks in our lives. There are a lot of consequences that the Bible says, and if we did a theology of this, there's just tons of what happened to the Corinthians and what happened to the New Testament church because of their neglecting or directly disobeying God. And by the way, all this is Christian. I'm not talking about unsaved people here. This is operative in the New Testament. This is for Christians that I'm talking about. In the New Testament, for believers. But look what Titus 2 says. After all this, God's expectations, what he wants from us. Verse 11, grace. Grace. Paul says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now that could be talking about Jesus Christ, uh, or it could be talking about actual the, the uh, 
spiritual quality we call grace, which is God uh, giving us what we don't deserve. That's the bottom line of what grace is. He gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy is he doesn't give us what we do deserve. Grace is he gives us what we don't deserve. None of us deserve to have the strength to do verses 1 through 10. But the grace of God that brings salvation, if you've truly been saved by grace, verse 12 says, it will teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, choice, that's code for choice. Denying? Denying? Is that the Holy Spirit doing something? Oh, yeah, he's the one that prompts and works within us, for it is he who wills and to do according to his good pleasure. That's the operating system. That's behind, you know what it starts with? Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he every man, any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away his own lust and enticed. And what God says is, every time that temptation faces you, God is faithful and he's made an exit door. See the nice big red letters over there? God has made the exit door. He does not throw us through it. You have to walk over there. He stands in the door. He motions to us. He prompts us. He woos us. But when you don't walk through the door, you end up like David. You know what it says in 1 Chronicles? It said, David completely followed the Lord all of his days except in the case of Uriah's wife. Doesn't even call her Bathsheba. Uriah's wife. Uriah was dead. She was still his wife. David illicitly took her. In the New Testament, we have choices. And, if, and, and it says in Titus 2, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's a choice. And, and what, what, what blessing flows from that choice? That we get to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope. Do you know what happens if we don't deny ungodliness and worldly lusts? The default system clicks in. The whole book to the Corinthians is about the default system. As soon as they stopped offering themselves back to God, fleshly, they're Christians, drunk. They're Christians, fornication. They're Christians, suing the pants off each other for every dime they can get in the law courts because they were greedy. They're Christians. Oh, so you can live like the devil and be a Christian? Yeah, but there are consequences that grace does not remove. The Christians in Corinth were confused. In fact, let's go to Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. I mean, it couldn't be clearer than 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8. Now he who plants and waters are one, and each one, 1 Corinthians 3, 8, will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, if you were here this morning, we saw that the holy God, absolutely holy, the more powerful than the summation of everything in the universe, God, is our Father in heaven. And the first thing I told you is he rewards. Now look at this. Verse 8, 1 Corinthians 3. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I could go on and on all night, but I think I've said enough for Dale that there is latitude within God's will. It is not God's will that you go through life feeling useless, constantly being spanked, being moody, distant from God, under the domination of the flesh, because you neglect to read his word and pray and seek and deny ungodliness. And we could go through Romans 6. All of Romans 6 is saying, you must take the initiative. You must put to death by God's grace. The power comes from God. The choice. 
that he desires from us, we must make. That's how it's written in the Bible. God, it's not that the cylinder is not firing. The grace is not enough to make us want to deny ungodliness. God has given us everything we need to operate in this system. It's in the back office. And so he says, you have a conscious, personal choice. Obey and be blessed. Disobey, click into the default system, and you will have anxiety, you will have fears, you will feel like your life is wasted, you'll get desperate the older you get, and keep trying to do something, and you just, it just piles up here. And what ends up is, look at this. Each one's life, verse 13, will become clear. What's gonna become clear? What you did with your time that no one saw but the one who sees in secret, which is verse 12. Building with, and look on the positive side, is gold, you can make golden choices, you can make silver choices, or you can make precious stone choices. Or you can operate over here and have your whole life be wooden, uh, straw, or broken up, crumbled straw stubble. It's your choice. Remember what it said in verse 8? Everyone's going to receive his own reward according to his own labor, according to what you chose. That is how the whole New Testament is written. The backdrop, Ephesians 1 through 3, is talking about wow. But a lot of people, the wow, makes them think, whatever happens is going to happen. No. It's always you obey, you want to please me, I'll reward you in eternity with you're going to have something to cast at my feet. In life, you're going to have the best life possible. Joel Osteen, your best life now? He didn't think of that. I've never read the book, and I'm not sure what he's talking about. Your best life is on this side. This is awful, especially if, you're, if you know the Lord. It's miserable. It's miserable to waste our, our life as God's temple and to look what's going to happen. Verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he'll receive a reward. You, you obeyed what God wanted. You read the Bible like a child and said, wow, God wants me to not be anxious and trust him. God wants me to obey him. He wants me to pray and he wants me to trust. and He wants me to stay in step with his spirit, Galatians 5, 16. But look at the next verse, verse 15. If anyone's work is burned... Work is what we did with our lives, what we did in our bodies. Every moment the clock is running. Every moment. You and I are generating wood and hay. You watch the combines, remember? We just went through the fall and they just were everywhere doing those soybeans. And they can plow into that soybean field and out the back is just chaff coming out. Same thing behind those corn combines. But anything that was worthwhile went in the hopper. And look, look what happens. If anyone's work is burned, all the chaff, all that's going to be burned, he will suffer loss. Do you think it's God's will? Do you think God willed that God has decreed that he's going to march you in front of the whole universe, march me in front of the whole universe and say, I decree and it's my will that you suffer loss. That was my plan for your life. And I'm going to show it. I'm going to burn up everything you did, and you are going to suffer loss and weep. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible says, I have done everything I can to give you my will. But I will not force you or make you obey me. I'm going to let you be prompted by love. Do you love yourself? Remember, I used to say this all the time, only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Your flesh makes television more important than God. Your flesh makes exhibiting your body more important than magnifying the Spirit of God. Flesh or spirit, it's a choice. Hey, we have seven minutes for one more question. Dale, can I stop? Do you mind? I could work this to death. <laughs> 